Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where currently we're studying the Book of Acts. Uh, what a powerful narrative to actually go through it chapter by chapter and see what God has to say to us. One of the things that was with me all day yesterday is in Acts 2 where uh, they all spake with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what came to me was God doesn't talk in tongues. <laughs> Did you know that? God does not talk in tongues. And a lot of people who are seeking the baptism in the Holy Ghost need to understand that because you're praying and you're seeking and you're you're waiting. You say, okay, God, here I am. Give it to me. God doesn't do anything without an act of your will, and God doesn't do anything without an act of faith. It doesn't take any faith to expect to have some sort of a spiritual seizure whereby you just ecstatically and without your volition begin to articulate in other tongues. It doesn't work like that. It didn't work that way in on the day of Pentecost. Go read it. It says, they all spake with tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what I'm saying to you is, God doesn't talk in tongues. He has He has never talked in tongues. And so, uh, what does he do? He gives you the utterance. Here's an example. I, I know just a little bit I, of uh, crude apprehension of Cajun French. And in Cajun French, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is la baptême de la Saint Esprit. Now, if I said, now you need to say that after me, la batem de la Santa Esprit, and then if you were to go ahead and say that, I would have given you an utterance, but you spoke it. It was just as much an act of uh, your will not to say after me just now, as it was to say after me just now. But the problem is, if you're asking for something, if you're asking for an utterance, God's giving it. You need to speak it. You're the one. God doesn't talk in tongues. You talk in tongues. And so that's what we need to understand. God is not. Somebody said the other day, let God just pull my tongue out and wag it. And no, it doesn't work that way. You're asking for something God will never do. You're asking for something that requires absolutely no faith. No faith at all to receive that way. Uh, God gives the utterance. The Spirit gives the utterance. What am I saying? Your spirit has the capacity of speech just like uh, your mind does. You have a speech capability in your physical body, in your brain, that your mind, this ethereal, ephemeral thing called your mind, uh, that your mind is capable of accessing your speech center and speaking in your known language. Well, your spirit has the capability. You don't just have a mind. You have a mind in you. You also have a spirit in you. And your spirit, you can give your spirit access to the speech center of your brain. And the spirit of God who lives in your spirit, well, thank you very much. And he's going to give you an utterance. Now, that's the Spirit speaking, but it was by my choice. Uh, look, I'll do it again. That's an act of my will. I initiated it. I took the utterance. And when you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it's just a stream of this utterance. It's like a switch on the inside of you. You take the speech center of your brain, you take the reins of the speech center of your brain away from your mind, you give it to your spirit, and your spirit has the capacity to And if you want to receive it any other way, I understand that. People want to have this overwhelming emotional thing, but if you demand and refuse to cooperate with the Spirit of God unless He gives it to you on your terms, that's being a rebel. <laughs> And, and the thing is, is people, that they carry this victimization around them. 
been in church my whole life and seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost for 40 years. Well, you rebel, you. How come you are so uh, entrenched in a stubborn refusal to give, and, and more often than not, it's ignorance, it's lack of teaching. So be encouraged to know that God doesn't speak in tongues. He doesn't speak in tongues on the throne. He's not going to speak in tongues by reaching and grabbing your tongue and making it wag. He'll give you the utterance. And how do you know? Because you're not going to understand it. You'll know. Here's one of the litmus tests. That's just me. That's just me. No, it's not. You're not that smart. (laughs) If it was you, you would understand it. You don't understand it. You have to take what he gives you, even if it's one syllable. And begin to say it. Does that help you? I hope that helps somebody today. Now today is giving day. And one of the things God spoke to me on Sunday, of course, you've heard me say, giving should always be done in a revelatory atmosphere. When you give in a revelatory atmosphere, money will begin to move by the Spirit. The plowman will overtake the reaper. There will be a bounty. He that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. How do you, how do you activate that process? By giving in a revelatory atmosphere. Part of that is, I remember, you know, we've, you've heard me talk about giving into a need, giving to the poor. There's giving into a need, and there's giving into the anointing. The fact of the matter is, when you give into the anointing, you're giving into your own need. Because guess what? You need the anointing. And I remember Kitty and I, years and years ago, we gave into Kim Clement's ministry. We gave sacrificially. We gave something specific. We gave our vacation money. There was an immediate impartation back into our life. Because with our gift, it's really important, with our gift, we uh, had a prayer request. We had a desire, a prayer request in our hearts. And that prayer request, and we, and we took the trouble of giving it to Kim Clement himself, and they actually called us up. They said, well, if you do that, there won't be a tax break. Said, well, we understand that. We're not concerned about that. We just want to lay this at his feet, this amount of money. And uh, it was uh, $1,000, as yes. I recall. And that was a big deal for us. Very, very, I, it, there was not going to be a vacation. Now there was. And the vacation happened because God provided. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we gave the gift. And our prayer was, we wrote a note to Kim Clement. We said, if you are disposed to pray for us, we have a heart to be full-time in ministry. Well, you know what? I've been trying to get, God had had me leave the ministry. I was working for my denomination. He told me to go into business. I've been wanting to get back into ministry for 15 years. We gave that gift. And within four months, we were catapulted into what has now become a worldwide ministry. Mm -hmm. So when you give today, give into your own need. We gave to Kim Clement, yes, but we did it with the sense of this is our need. This is what we have need of. This is what we want. This is what we desire. Give into your desire. Give into your own vision. Give into that thing and your heart that you're aching for, and give, and give sacrificially. He that sows, say, how can you say that? Because the scripture says, he that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. I want you to get the bounty. I don't want you to get just some marginal, minimal something. And when you give into an anointing, what's in that anointing becomes an immediate impartation. you got to understand, what hadn't happened in 15 years happened in a matter of months for us. And we've been hanging on. It's like hanging on to the side of a locomotive going 300 (laughs) miles, them bullet trains going 300 miles an hour, hanging on for dear life. The um, velocity, the momentum of what that set in motion. I challenge you. I urge you. I encourage you today. Give into the anointing. How do you do that? You go to fathersartministry.net. You can also put in propheticnow.com. Click on the donation link. It's really important to give in the anointing. You can give it any time and it'll work. But giving into the anointing in the moment, uh, 
pick up the phone and call Katie in, our, in the office. You'll see, you go to propheticnow.com, click on the donation link. You'll see Kate, the, the office number, call Katie. You can give some of you in third world countries. PayPal doesn't work for you. Uh, there's things standing in your way. Use Western Union. Katie will give you instructions. Communicate with Katie. She will instruct you how to do that. Why? Because we're after your money. No, I'm after your breakthrough. What are you after? Uh, what about uh, electronic giving? People say, I don't like PayPal. But a lot of people use it. We have the Square option. And you can also, people say, I don't give electronically. I mean, there is a mailing address that you can mail in. Mail in. So into your own need and see what God does. I also want to remind you that uh, you can get the dedicated app for the Morning Light broadcast in the Android app market and in the iPhone app market. Just do a search in the app market for either Android or iPhone for Father's Heart Ministry. And when you do that, you'll be able to install the dedicated app and uh, you can also go through Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, to get the live broadcast. And you can just search for Father's Heart Ministry in the Spreaker um, search engine. And that's the service we use to broadcast audio. And you can get us that way. You ought to look also for Warren Hunter. His, he's got a lot of messages, Apostle Warren Hunter. you want to listen to those as well. And then uh, the other thing that you can do, and it's not live, but we syndicate these audios out to the YouTube platform. And so if you go to YouTube and look up Russ and Kitty or Father's Heart Ministry, and you can uh, subscribe to the playlist for the Morning Light broadcast. And you'll get an email every time one's available, and you can access it that way as well. God bless you. Oh, don't forget the free gift. I didn't even get a chance to talk about this. Check your email. And I'll be, I will be haven't posted it yet on the website, but I'll get to that uh, this morning. Uh, the free gift that we have is the introductory message to the Rivers of God message Amen. we did in Sterling, Virginia, Lord. when we preached Camp in the Cloud with Apostle Ricardo Watson just a few weeks ago. A powerful, powerful message. It will enlighten you. It will ignite something on the inside of you. We've only given away one other audio the whole time we've been doing Giving Day and giving something away to you like this every Friday. Get that download. It's an audio. It'll touch your life. It'll make a difference in your life. Uh, and how, how do you get that? Uh, look for the page. It's not there this moment. I'm going to put it up uh, after broadcast. It'll be done sometime this morning. If you're subscribed to The Daily Word, uh, you can get it from your email. I just emailed it to you just a while ago. And if you're on social media, do a search for Russell and Kitty Walden or Father's Heart Ministry or going to eChurch or any of those social media platforms we use. And I just posted it out there, and you can get it that way. And when you get it, I want to hear back from you. I want to hear how that message uh, uh, impacted you, what it, how it touched you. I really want to see the, the impact that it had on your life. So God bless you. Let's talk about Acts 13. The Ecclesia manifests. In Acts 13, we see the rise of the Ecclesia that Jesus prophesied about in Matthew 16, 18. It has taken almost 20 years. Jesus said he was going to build an Ecclesia, and it, wasn't, it didn't happen in Jerusalem. It wasn't until... The Antioch Church raised up in a company of prophets. You ever notice how prophets are these lone wolf guys? I hear people in prophetic schools say that. Oh, a prophet, he's an isolated guy. Well, these prophets in, in Jerusalem weren't. These prophets got together en masse, and they moved as a group from Jerusalem to Antioch. And what the result was the launching of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. You think the devil is working to isolate prophets? And I hear people say, I hear anointed prophets that are household names say, yes, the prophet is isolated on the mountain. Yeah, that's why we don't have any Apostle Pauls today. But when these prophets got together, you don't see any anointed ministry in the New Testament that it wasn't Paul and Barnabas, Silas and Barnabas. Uh, there was, Jesus sent them out two by two, James and John. You know why we don't see New character in New Testament ministry? We're not moving in, in the 
team dynamic that the ecclesia represents. The ecclesia of Jesus' day is entirely different. That's why God's called us to raise up a new generation of desert fathers and desert mothers. The prophets must come together. When the prophets come together as the Spirit led those from Jerusalem to Antioch, we will see, in short order, we will see ministries like the Apostle Paul raised up. The ecclesia of Jesus' day was far different than anything in terms of church that we know. In Antioch, the believers conducted themselves as a classical ecclesia, and the history and the spiritual trajectory of the entire region and the world shifted, and the womb of the Christian faith changed from Jerusalem to the city-state of Antioch. I really believe that God's original intention was to launch uh, Apostle Paul and his original destiny from Jerusalem. But Jerusalem, what were they doing? When Barnabas brought Paul there, what did they do? They hid out from him. They didn't do that in Antioch. They embraced him. They put him in the midst of a company of prophets. They prophesied his socks off. Mm -hmm. And he launched. And we're going to learn more about, about that. Let's read the first... Uh, it's a long chapter, but I wanted to do the whole thing today. The first 24 verses, please. Okay, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the workmen to have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John in them and, uh, to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name, sorry, if something popped up on my screen, so is his name by interpretation withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. And Saul also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon me, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist. And a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So, like what happened to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. didn't he? Wasn't see. he full of mischief? <laughs> yes. Wasn't he full of darkness? And murder. Wasn't he a child of the devil? Mm -hmm. Takes one to know one. <laughs> Verse 12 Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, and came, they came to Perga and Papilia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they had departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Poseida, Poseida, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent them out, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. <clears throat> then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand, Beckoning with his hands, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. Like, look at me and listen to me. <laughs> the God of his people, of the God of this people of Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manner their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And God gave them un unto them Saul, son of Sis, 
a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which is, shall fulfill all my will. And of this man's seed, God hath God, according to his, per, his promise, raised up unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. We want to talk about being fearfully and wonderfully made. Go back to that, what God was saying. He said he found David. <laughs> you realize this is God we're talking about? You know, God, God is God. He can do anything he wants, anytime he wants. He doesn't have to check with anybody. God, had, over and over in the scripture, talks about God looking for something. Do you realize that God created something in man? that he knew he would have to look for. The God who knows everything, the ineffable God, the omniscient God, put something on the inside of us that he would have to look for. And he <laughs> found David. What's he looking for in you? Amen. So in chapter 13 of Acts, we find the first church that actually conducted itself like the ecclesia, Jesus said he would raise up. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus declared to his disciples that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The problem, this is probably the worst mistranslation in the scripture, and it's the worst mistranslation we really didn't have any choice about. Because we have no, uh, we don't have an understanding of what an ecclesia is and was to the people Jesus was talking to. The word Jesus used that is translated church, look it up, is ecclesia. What we need to know about this word is that it was not unknown to the disciples at the time Jesus used it. They knew exactly, they knew instantly what the ecclesia was. They were intimately familiar with it. Uh, it was not unknown to them, and the image it cast in their minds, when Jesus used that term ecclesia, the picture in the minds of those that were listening, was nothing, 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 did I say nothing, compared to the word church, what it suggests to us today. The word church in our understanding, derives from an old English Germanic word, Circe or Kirk, which means a place of assembly set aside for Christian worship. Hmm. But when they heard the word ecclesia, when Jesus said this to them, they did not think of a place. They did not think of a religion. They did not think of anything we would consider to be religious. What they thought of was a very secu what we would call a secular concept, although they didn't have an understanding of secular sacred back then. That word church in no way describes or even remotely connects with the word ecclesia that Jesus chose to declare that he would raise up. And ecclesia is not a place. They did not think of it like a synagogue which was the, the church as we know it is most closely associated with the idea of if he would have said, on this rock I will build my synagogue, they instantly would have known what he was talking about. That would have made total sense to him. But an ecclesia was a foreign army raised up for the invasion of enemy territory that was led by a general called an apostolus. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Or is it familiar to you, that language? In the first century, there was not one person in Judea who didn't instantly and completely know what this meant because the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire under Alexander had dominated and conquered the people of the Middle East for centuries, operating as a classical ecclesia. As a, the Greek city-states... They would gather together battle-hardened soldiers. Those soldiers would agree that we need to go to war. They agreed to go to war, and they chose a leader among them. They would call it Apostolos. Then those soldiers would build a fleet of ships. They would board those ships. 
and invite the apostles to lead them into battle. That's exactly how it worked. The word ecclesia, at the time Jesus used it, had no religious connotations. The sense that it, it evoked in Jesus' hearers would be the same idea we would think of when we say SWAT team, Army Rangers, Navy SEAL team, only on a much, much larger scale. We think of a SEAL team or a SWAT team, we think about a squad of soldiers, but this is an army. This is a huge army covering uh, the earth like ants, and grasshoppers, I mean, just many, many of them. The ecclesia was not only a military bo body, it was a governmental one. What would happen if we decided to start a new government here in the United States or in your nation? You'd get in big trouble. You say, no, no, we're not this government. We're, we're following this government. They try that all the time. They wind up in jail, these knuckleheads out there trying to do that. And ecclesia was a governmental body. In ancient Greece, again, an ecclesia was formed by a quorum. This is one of the visions I have, is to have 6,000 soldiers, battle-ready soldiers. Mm -hmm. You had to have two years of heavy battle experience to be in the ecclesia. And they had to have 6,000 come together to make to do business and to make any decisions. And they would, and get, did they have that many in Antioch? I promise you they did. Antioch was the second largest city in the ancient world. I promise you the ecclesia in Antioch was very much uh, a classical ecclesia. They understood who they were and what they were. Once the decision was made that, yes, we need to go to war, these 6,000 soldiers would then choose a leader from among their ranks. You notice that Paul is mentioned. The prophets and teachers were coming together, fasting, ministering to the Lord, and they named a few of them and Saul, because what was Saul before he was an apostle? He was a prophet. He was a teacher with the prophets and teachers in Antioch. Now, once the apostolus was chosen... The word apostolic, you know where I got this? I was sitting in church in Las Vegas, Nevada, and the pastor said something about an apostle. The Lord told me to look it up. And the word apostle means from the fleet. <laughs> what? No, it means sent one, doesn't it? Look it up. It means from the fleet. What fleet? And then I just followed it out, and I found all this stuff out. It's not hard to find. Uh, once the apostolus is chosen, the members of the ecclesia who chose him would then finance and build with their own two hands a fleet of ships which they would then man to sail into battle. In other words, Paul was always answering back to Antioch. Now he was asked to go answer to the 11 apostles, to the 12 apostles in Jerusalem, and he grudgingly did it. You know why? Because they didn't send him. They hid from him when he went to Jerusalem. <laughs> And he came, went there and he said, I went down there to them to see. They're going to tell me if I'm running in vain. You know what? They didn't add a thing to me. <laughs> but he never once mouthed off like that about Antioch. He went back to Antioch time and time again because that was the ecclesia that laid hands on him and sent him. Now, when the fleet would land on foreign shores, the apostolus would lead a delegation. You look at the apostles going on their missionary journeys from city to city. They were going as a delegation. And what were they doing? Good news. The apostolus would show up, up from Rome. He would show up. He's got a fleet in the harbor, but he leaves them on the ships. He shows up and he says, hey, let me make the case. Let me make you an offer you can't refuse. Let me make the case for you coming into the Roman Empire. Look at all the things that you get. He would make the case with a delegation of peace. That's why we're supposed to preach peace. If they would allow, that nation would allow that apostolus to annex them into the empire that sent the ecclesia. He would make the case for peaceably accepting their rule, but if the offer would tur were turned down, that delegation of peace became an invading army and they would invade and they would take the area by force. All of this was common knowledge to Jesus' hearers because every nation, every one of them in the Middle East had been conquered by an ecclesia. They instantly knew what was involved. They knew that Jesus was drafting them to war. He was not talking about establishing a network of places of worship. That's not, whatever that is, that's not what he had in mind. And I understand, just because it's the, 
ubiquitous universal expression of what we call Christianity doesn't mean it's this. In the beginning days of the early church in Jerusalem and Samaria, think about it now, before Antioch, we're looking back, before Antioch, Philip is having a revival, they're preaching the gospel, they're laying money at the apostles' feet, they got a nice Christian commune, a lot of hippies there. And, uh, but yet, it's interesting that, that it weren't going anywhere. Notice, remember it said that they, the believers scattered out of Jerusalem except the apostles. That would be like the ecclesia chooses the apostle, builds the fleet, and the apostle says, y'all go, go, we're going to stay here. It's the anti-ecclesia. It's the opposite <laughs> of an ecclesia that Jesus said he was going to build. See, in the early days of the church in Jerusalem and Samaria, they didn't act much like an ecclesia. The church was full of power. It was full of life. You can get away with a lot when you're full of the life and power of God. But it doesn't mean your wineskin is set in order. It spread from house to house. It had very little, if any, organization or structure. The primary connection between the church in one town and the church in another was maintained by the 11 original apostles by sending one of their number out to sanction. Philip has revival. People are getting saved. He's being translated from city to city, and the apostles are trying to catch up with him. Yep, 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 that's of God. Yep, 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 that's of God. Yep, 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 that's of God. Where'd he go? Where'd, which way did he go? Which way did he go? He's kidding. Every time the apostles show up, Philip's translated to the next town. You think God was doing something to draw those guys out? Mm-hmm who were refusing to go. I don't know what they were thinking. He said go, and they decided to stay. The ministry of Paul, when we come to Antioch, there's this marked shift. When we come to Antioch, in how the church operated, that resulted in the launching of the ministry of Paul. The ministry of Paul was inaugurated by and supported by the believers in Antioch. And Paul's influence on the church in all human history could not be overestimated. The implication for us is that if we learn how to be an ecclesia, as the church of Antioch did, we will see men and women of God raised up who will confront our world with the claims of Christ, even as Paul did as an apostle sent out and backed by the ecclesia at Antioch. Now, why would God choose Antioch? Antioch was the provincial capital of the Roman Empire. In fact, the city of Antioch was the imperial center of power that controlled the Middle East and the entire Orient as far as the Roman Empire extended. The only city larger in size and greater in importance than Antioch was Rome itself. Because of that, and it's interesting that history doesn't tell you that, Antioch is no Antioch. You have, we have no idea how powerful Antioch was. Because of what the church did in Antioch and how they conducted themselves, historians call this city, not Jerusalem, they call Antioch the cradle of Christianity. Mm -hmm. In verse 1 of our chapter, what did, God, what did God call Jerusalem at this time? Antioch was the cradle of Christianity, and at the same time they were earning that name, the Spirit of God was speaking to John on the Isle of Patmos called Jerusalem, spiritually called Sodom and Gomorrah. We need to think about that. So in verse 1 of our chapter, we see that the prophets and teachers in Antioch came together for a period of days to fast and minister to the Lord. Now, where did these prophets come from? In Acts eleven twenty seven, we find a report that a group of prophets led by a man named Agabus banded together and moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. Why did they do this? The Spirit of God led them. The Spirit of God said, something's happening in Antioch. And these prophets got together. And the first thing Agabus did was to prophesy to the Antioch church, you need to get some money together, go send it to Jerusalem, because their economy is about to crash. And guess what? They did it. All you prophets always talking about money. Yeah, in the, in the traditions of Agabus the prophet, in the traditions of the company of prophets that launched the Apostle Paul, yes, we're talking about your money. <laughs> After delivering these financial gifts, they sent the money by Saul and Barnabas, actually by Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas is always mentioned first. He's a nice buffer <laughs> between the people and Saul. 
<laughs> after delivering the financial gifts, Barnabas and Saul, what did they do? They went back to Antioch to find, what did they find? They show up, the prophets and the teachers are fasting, praying, and prophesying. It is, listen, it really speaks to me. It's the only enclave, it's the only conclave of prophets mentioned in the New Testament narrative. But the only time they ever got together, they launched an Apostle Paul. Is there any reason why we define the prophetic as that which absolutely never comes together, and therefore we don't see any Apostle Pauls. The prophets pride themselves, yes, I must hold myself aloof from the people. Yeah, I get that. You're part of the problem. You're not part of the solution. God's calling prophets together. It's one of the things God told Kenny and I. I said, God, what are you doing in Arizona? What are we doing in Arizona? He said, I've called you to raise up a new generation of apostolic fathers and mothers to bring the people together, to bring the prophets together, to bring the apostles together. What's the plan? I have no clue. No idea. Isn't that God. cool? <laughs> <laughs> so while they're fasting and praying, a prophetic word comes forth, interestingly enough, not from Agabus, because when Agabus prophesied, his name always got mentioned. He had a little ego, didn't he? You make sure you put my name on that. <laughs> but it was an unnamed prophet who gives a word, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein to I've called them. That's apostolic language. That's an ecclesia choosing an apostolos. It was unmistakable ecclesiastical verbiage and ecclesiastical ac activity in the purest sense on the part of this governing body of believers. See, Revelation 19.10 says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And through this prophetic company, Jesus, as the apostolos, the primary apostolos of our faith, is speaking through the spirit of prophecy, saying, separate me. I want the ecclesia to separate this couple, these two men, and send them out. So in sending out Barnabas and Saul, the believers laid hands on them as an act of identification. They went to Jerusalem, and the apostles were running from them, <laughs> hiding from them. These people are identifying with them. They didn't have the attitude like Nicodemus, come to him by night. And they charged them with their mission. They were saying to Barnabas and Saul, we're with you, we're sending you, we're supporting you, and you're going out to proclaim and advance the kingdom. They are then described in verse 4 as being sent out by the Holy Ghost, and they sail to Cyprus. And what do they do? They immediately confront the Jewish people with the claims of Christ. What are they doing? They're coming to the Jewish nation, just like they knew what Apostolos did. They saw themselves as not going to individuals. No, we're coming to confront a nation. We're bringing some good news. We have a gospel of peace. Here's the message. Here, let's make the case for you allowing the God of the universe to annex you into his kingdom. What happened? The Jews rejected it. Guess what happened next? Their nation was destroyed in a few short years after this. We don't make the connection between the sending of Barnabas and Saul and the destruction of Judea, Jerusalem, and the leveling of the temple. But there is a direct causal link. Ask yourself this question. How bad do you want to see America bow its knee to Jesus? How badly do you want to see your nation come to Christ? Jesus sent the disciples out, telling them not just to teach individuals, but to disciple nations. How do you disciple a nation? This is exactly what Paul and Barnabas did. And because the Jewish nation rejected their, the gospel, their nation ceased to exist. That's how an apostolos and an ecclesia operates. Would you be willing to see God raise up a Paul and a Barnabas in our day? A Paul and a Barnabas that would so radically present the gospel of the kingdom that if America didn't accept it, it would cease to exist as a nation. Oh, I don't want that. Well, then you just located yourself. See, the answer to that question locates us as to the condition of our heart. Do our loyalties lie with our country or do our loyalties lie with the kingdom? Paul had to make that decision. He had to be willing to see his nation. He saw the curtain of unbelief like a veil descending upon his nation because of his preaching. He was acting as an apostolos, as an ecclesia. 
He knew if they didn't receive it, he knew they would be destroyed. How bad do you want to see revival? Do you want to see revival so badly that God sends out an apostolic authority in the earth that so confronts our nation that if they don't receive, if they do not capitulate and allow the nation of the United States to be annexed into the kingdom of God, that it will cease to exist as a nation? Verse 25 through the end of the chapter. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to lose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fear God, to you is the word of salvation sent. And they that dwell in Jerusalem and all their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voice of his prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, and they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. And he was seen many days of them, which came up from him, came up with him from Galilee, Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto our fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith uh, also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Be, uh, beware, therefore, lest you that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, you despisers and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your day, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking unto them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Hello! But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Withdrawing the offer, now they'll be destroyed. Mm. Mm. An apostolus acting like an ecclesia. Mm. Verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be in salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coasts. They didn't want any part of it. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy, and with the Holy Ghost. So notice when a Paul and Barnabas went out together that from the very beginning, Barnabas is named first. Even in the prophetic word, it's so interesting, God put Barnabas in charge by the prophetic word. Mm -hmm. Well, hello. Sorry. <laughs> you got... Popular place. You got mail. You got mail. <laughs> and <clears throat> Paul was anointed and called, but Barnabas was more material. Somebody always has to be in charge. Anything with two heads is a freak. You will notice as well that God didn't send them out one by one, but two by two. When you begin to see two by two mentions, that's why it's always Russ and Kitty. Mm -hmm. When you begin to see two by two, and you don't see singular men, think about it. And then no reflection on these men. I'm just giving you an example. Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, uh, Bob 
Jones, Chuck Pierce. What is it? That's not two by two. I'm not saying they're doing it wrong. I'm just saying that we're not there yet. We're not here. We're not what we're seeing here in Acts 13. No. And we need to see it. And uh, Paul was uh, uh, anything. Uh, uh, you'll notice that as well, that God didn't send them out one by one, two by two. God works in the context of companionship and teamwork. That's why it's all about power couples in the kingdom right now. When they travel to the Isle of Paphos, they are confronted by a sorcerer who held sway over the governor of the area. When you are around influential people, always look for the sorcerer. I, I can't put emotion into what I'm saying. I'm going to run out of time. When you're around influential people, always look for the sorcerer. Christians operating in the spirit of sorcery abound. They call themselves protectors of the anointing. They call themselves armor bearers. They are spiritual. Yes, they're spiritual. They're even profoundly spiritual, but they're not godly. You can identify the sorcerer in your midst by the one who's always calling everybody else a Jezebel. When at the very heart of their character is manipulation, deception, they are very dangerous. Elemis tries to run interference between Paul and the governor of the area. Have you ever encountered those who seek to run interference between you and a leader? Now, we're not talking about operating in good order and necessary structure. We're talking about those who try to suppress anything they can't control. Paul looks at the man and calls him out for his mischief. Notice what Paul does. The blindness that came on Paul on the road to Damascus is now transferred as an impartation to Elemas. Was Paul trying to destroy Elemas? No. He knew the value of what happened to him on the Damascus road. He recognized in Elemas what had been exposed in his own life. He saw himself in Elemas. You can't give what you don't have. What was the result? The result was the governor had his eyes opened immediately and accepts the gospel. Now, use discernment. Is your city resistant to the gospel? Is the whole city coming to your meetings? Look for the sorcerer. Locate the sorcerer. Is your nation resistant to the gospel? Find those operating in the spirit of sorcery and control and militate in prayer against that and things will change. Now, Paul and Barnabas go on their missionary journeys, but in verse 46, they make a pivotal turn. The Jews have aggressively resisted the faith, and as a nation, Paul and Barnabas reject them and turn to the Gentiles. This is the beginning of the curtain falling spiritually upon the Jewish people. They will languish and still languish today under consequences of rejecting the message of God's apostolos sent to them. Then the light of the gospel now turns to the Gentile nations and eventually reaching down to you and I. Now, when he quoted, he said, we're a light set to the whole world. He was quoting Isaiah. When Isaiah complained to God that he thought he was supposed to reunite divided Israel, that's what Isaiah thought his calling was. And he realized it was not going to happen in his lifetime because they were fixing to saw him asunder. And he saw the end that he wasn't going to fulfill what he thought his calling was. And God said to him, it's a small thing, Isaiah, that I would use you to bring together a divided Israel. I will set you to be a light to the Gentiles and all the nations of the earth shall come into my kingdom. And Saul reached back and he said, that's talking about me. I am the light to the Gentiles. Isn't that powerful? Just like the prophet that spoke against the altar at Bethel, and he said 300 years from now, a king, Josiah by name, will be raised up that will kill the prophets at Bethel and will grind their uh, idols to powder and cause the king in Samaria to drink it. And 300 years later, a boy king in a ruined city commanded that the temple be, it was a, it was a dump heap, and he commanded it to be cleaned out, and a scribe found a scroll and begins to read it to the king, and the whole house begins to tremble. And said, uh, 300 years from now, oh, it's been 300 years, uh, there'll be a king, Josiah, Josiah by name. Can't you see that young boy, king, eight years old? He sits up, and he knows that scroll's been back there for 300 years. 
a hundred years older than the Constitution of the United States. And his naming his name, he found himself. That's what Paul did. He looked back and he suddenly he realizes, this is who I am. I'm this guy. I turn from this nation, his nation, to the Gentiles. And through him in that moment, the light of the gospel, fueled by, channeled by, a group of prophets in Antioch that laid hands on those men and sent them out to confront the nations and the entire geopolitical makeup of the known world was completely shifted because of one ecclesia church that sent out a man of God. God is calling together an ecclesia today. God is calling together a company of prophets and teachers. He's calling together his people to become that to become in our day what Antioch was in that day, that we can have a ministry like the Apostle Paul that the world cannot marginalize and the prevailing religious system cannot ignore. And if they do, they will pass from the scene. Father God, raise up your ecclesia. Raise up. We've been in battle. We know what battle is. Now, God, we need you to bring us together as an ecclesia by whatever means are at your disposal to cause us to come together and to be that Antioch, to be that modern-day Antioch. If it's a digital Antioch, if it's a southwestern Antioch, if it's a whatever has to happen, oh, God, that you would bring together an Antioch to release, to launch an Apostle Paul who will confront nations and restore the order of your domain to the earth as Paul did in that day. In Jesus' name, amen.